This episode is sponsored by you. Stay tuned till the end to find out how you help make this project real. One of the best known stories in Norse mythology is the journey of Thor, Loki, and their companions to the mysterious land of Utgarthr, the outer world. In this strange realm, the god of thunder and the trickster are soon to realize that nothing is what it seems, as they're challenged in ways they had never known before. Utgarthr is a land where the mighty Thor is outfought by a frail old woman, where Loki meets one who outdoes even his schemes, and where nothing is what it seems. By studying the journey into this mysterious realm which challenges even the mightiest of gods, we can come out with a greater understanding of our world's mysteries and how to rise to the challenges we face. My name is Sean. Welcome to Mythos and Logos. As a quick primer for anyone unfamiliar with the Norse pantheon beyond a selection of comic books and blockbuster films, the Norse gods, known as the Aesir, are quite different from other classical pantheons. The Aesir have limits, they have faults, and they even often have the scars to show for it, seen in Odin's missing eye, Thor's facial scar of shrapnel from a battle, and Lucky's mouth scar from when his lips were sewn shut. A fate which many of the gods would say he deserved, but that's a story for another time. All this is to say that the Norse gods are, in many ways, actually quite human. And just like we humans do, in Norse mythology, the Aesir often face challenges that seem beyond even their great abilities. A prime example of this is found when Thor, his servant Thjalfi, and the trickster god Loki set out on a journey to a far-off land. They stop to rest for the night in a deep cave, but struggle to get a pleasant sleep as they are woken repeatedly by loud and rumbling earthquakes. When Thor goes to investigate, he finds the source, a massive giant. Now this giant, outsizing any other giant Jotnar or troll that Thor has fought before, is sleeping, thankfully, with its snores responsible for rocking and shaking the surrounding lands. When the giant does wake, he introduces himself to Thor and his companions as Skrymir, and starts searching for a lost glove. Skrymir quickly finds the glove, picking up what the travelers thought was the cave they were staying in, and slipping it on to his hand. Skrymir invites Thor, Loki, and Thjalfi to travel with him on their way to Utgarthr even being so kind as to carry their supplies. A gentle giant, it seems. But if encountering this massive giant has not already led the travelers to suspect that something strange is happening, the next night will be sure to show them that their journey is truly into the unknown and unexpected. The next night, Skrymir hands the travelers their sealed bag of supplies and goes to sleep beneath a truly massive tree. Relieved to finally have some rest, Thor goes to open the sack for food, but with all his strength, cannot untie it, becoming understandably increasingly frustrated with each failed attempt. Failure is not something Thor is used to. And so, with the intense and hangry rage that only a day without meals can bring, Thor raises his hammer Mjolnir to the sky and strikes Skrymir right on the head. Yet, 
The giant only mumbles and wonders if an acorn fell from a tree onto him and goes back to sleep. So Thor raises Mjolnir once again, landing another blow, and Skrymir, half asleep, wonders if a bird making its nest must have dropped a twig from one of the branches. One last time, more frustrated and angry than ever, Thor raises his hammer, summoning thunder, using all of his strength in one mighty shot to Skrymir's head, and one last time, Skrymir just mumbles in his sleep, shrugging it off. So that night, Thor goes to sleep, both dejected and hungry. When Skrymir wakes, surely boasting about what a peaceful sleep he had the night before, he gets up and leads the travelers on the final leg of their journey, leading them to the gate of the gigantic castle Utgarthr, the Outer Realm. As they approach, the giant Skrymir tells them that he is small compared to the residents of Utgarthr, and that they should be ready to meet some real giants among the castle's inhabitants. So Skrymir departs as the gate opens, and Thor, Loki, and Thjalfi are greeted by the largest giant they have ever seen, the realm's king, Utgartha Loki. Not to be confused with the trickster god. But Utgartha Loki welcomes them, informing them of the castle's policy that everyone who stays there is the absolute best at something. So Loki is the first of our travelers to step forward, announcing that he is the fastest eater in any realm, especially confident after a day without food. And so the king matches Loki against Logi, the castle's champion eater. And a massive table is set, Loki on one end and Logi on the other, with the first man to reach the center to be declared the winner. So Loki eats with a fury that only hunger can bring, and comes to meet Logi in the middle of the table. But before it can be called a draw, they each pull back and realize that while Loki ate all of his meat, Logi ate the meat, the bones, and even the table itself. So that's score one for the giants and score zero for the travelers. Thor's servant Thialfi is the next to step up, as he is able to run faster than any man. Thialfi is brought to the starting line against a giant named Hugi. Yet, in all his attempts, Hugi is always at least slightly faster than Thialfi. After three lost races, Thialfi finally resigns. Score two for the residents of Utgarthr. Upset by their two losses, Thor steps up to Utgartha Loki ready to face any challenge he is given. So Thor, renowned as a great drinking man, is given a massive drinking horn, which he's told the best drinkers can finish in one gulp, most party animals can finish in two, and that almost anyone can finish in three. So Thor takes the horn in his hands, and with a mighty godly swig, looking down, he realizes he's barely made a dent in the level of the mead. So Thor drinks for a second time, and when he comes up, he sees that he's made some progress, but still not nearly enough. So finally, Thor summons all of his godly might for one last chug, going and drinking until he must come up for air. And while he has made a noticeable difference in the level of mead, it is still nowhere near empty. Score 3-0 in favor of the Giants. But Utgartha Loki, a good sport, offers Thor another challenge, this time to try and lift his cat. But like any cat owner will tell you, they don't always cooperate, and if a cat doesn't want to be lifted, it's not going to let you. So with the motions of a typical bending cat, but in a far greater scale, the cat twists and turns and bends itself in so many ways that with all of his strength, Thor can only manage to raise a single paw. That's three points for the giants, one point for the giant's kitty. 
still zero for the gods and their companion. Yet, Utgartha Loki offers Thor one last chance to prove his fabled strength. He offers Thor a wrestling match, and the ring is set. Surely the lights go down, the crowd goes wild, as Utgartha Loki picks up a microphone to address them. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Utgartha Loki. I am the advocate for the reigning, defending, undisputed, universal heavyweight champion of the world, my grandma, Ellie. And Granny comes out, a frail and ancient woman who can barely walk. Thor, understandably, isn't sure what to think of Grandma Ellie, but he also isn't one to back down from a challenge. So he locks up in combat with the old woman. Yet, no matter what moves he uses or with how much force he makes them, Thor cannot gain any advantage over Ellie. In fact, the harder he fights, it seems, the weaker he becomes until the mighty god of thunder is brought down to a knee. The match is called. The final point goes again to Utgarthar. Yet, Utgartha Loki must have been impressed with the traveler's valor, as he does indeed let them stay the night, which they enjoy in good cheer. When the morning comes, Utgartha Loki sends the travelers off with a final morning feast. And as they then depart with full bellies, Thor, Loki, and Thjalfi finally learn just why the giant was impressed enough to let them stay, despite their failures. Stopping them on their way out, the giant king explains. Now I will tell thee the truth. Now that thou art come out of the castle, thou shalt never again come into it. Thou shouldst never have come into it if I had known that thou hadst so much strength in thee, and that thou shouldst so nearly have had us in great peril. But I made against thee I illusions. Utgard the Lucky explains that he and Skrimir are in fact one and the same, tells of how he used magic to tie an invisible knot made of steel on their food bag, and how he redirected each blow of the hangry Thor's hammer to a nearby mountain range, where the blows from Mjolnir ended up creating three great square valleys. It is also through the powers of illusion that the traveler's challenges at the castle were not what they seemed. As any Icelandic-speaking listeners may already know, and you can spoil for the rest of us now, Loki's challenger, Logi, is named for the Old Norse word for flame, and is, the giant explains, the embodiment of wildfire itself. And not even Lucky could compete with the destructive appetite of a wildfire. The name of Thjalfi's opponent, Hugi, likewise means thought or mind, as try as you might, no man can outrun his own thoughts. Yet, easily the most remarkable of the illusions and challenges are the ones faced by Thor. It was no beer or mead that Thor drank. But in fact, the drinking horn was filled with the ocean, and though he didn't finish it, the part that Thor could drink is still missing to this day. The reason for the tides. The cat that Thor tried to lift was in fact no cat at all, but Jormungandr, the serpent of Midgarthr, who encircles the world, and whom Thor will battle at Ragnarok, the end of the world. And the old woman Ellie, true to her old Norse name, was in fact age personified. Even for all his power, Thor is no match for time, as old age eventually takes all who meet her. This story goes to show how in Norse mythology, 
The gods are limited, just like humans in this world. And against these powerful, primordial, and natural forces, even Thor and company are out of their depth. But there is hope. A modern reader of this story might wonder then why the Aesir were so revered by the Old Norse. Now, especially as archaeology suggests that Thor, who is deceived the most in this tale, was particularly revered among the Norse in many sites and pendants of Mjolnir found today. But this appeal is found not by turning to some esoteric mysticism, but instead to a more practical approach. Thor is not remarkable for his wisdom, like Odin, the king of the gods, nor for his cunning, like Loki, the trickster. What is remarkable about Thor is the courage with which he rises to even the greatest challenges. Now, many words can and have been used to describe Old Norse life, but easy is rarely found among them. The long nights of the cold, harsh north, filled with battles between families and kingdoms, there was no shortage of challenges, even for the most mighty. Whether forces of nature or deception by others, the challenges of Norse life required honor and courage to survive. And even those of us living in peaceful, comfortable places and times must still face the realities of passing time, struggle to manage or keep up with our own thoughts, and encounter many forces beyond our control. What the story of Thor, Loki, and Thjalfi and Utgarthur shows is that, on a practical level, by meeting these insurmountable challenges, we can still make a difference. This is how, even in their apparent failures, the travelers earn the respect and awe of the residents of Utgarthur, with the same courage that we can then apply in our own lives. Because even in their failures, the travelers manage to gain a great honor. And then, even in the face of an ocean, we can hope to make an impact as lasting and noticeable as the tides. Thank you for joining in this episode. Um, this was, a lot of people have been asking for a Norse story for quite some time. It was a bit outside of my comfort zone. It took a lot of studying, so special thanks go out to uh, Stella and Dr. Jackson Crawford. Um, Dr. Crawford's works and Stella's amazing insights have really helped in understanding the practicality of Norse culture. Now, this episode was sponsored by you. Um, whether through watching this with your likes and comments and support, it truly does help. And for many who even are able and gracious enough to help fund us on Patreon. Um, I can never thank you enough for everything that you do, even just watching and listening to make this possible. Next time, we will be at another story from Native American cultures and mythology. I hope to see you then. <laughs>